If after this webinar, you're looking for more information about the Children's Tumor Foundation and the work we do, it is available at www.ctf.org. We will do the best we can to answer all questions for after each research presentation. However, we may not get to all the questions and will only be able to address those general in nature and not each case specific question. Again, welcome and thank you for joining. Please use the chat function on the screen to, to tell us which country, state, or region you're from. Thank you for helping, support, helping CTF support you. This meeting is made possible by the generous financial, financial support of AstraZeneca in collaboration with NYU Langone Health and with planning support from Well Cornell and MSK Kids. Thank you to the most amazing planning committee members. That Dr. Caleb Yohei will elaborate more on the planning when he speaks. With that, I would like to turn it over to the Chief Scientific Officer, Salvatore Larosa. Welcome. I see already, thank you, Tresan, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I see already a lot of messaging uh, coming into the, into the chat. Please keep going. Uh, send your greetings where you're from. I think there's a lot of energy. We see you from all over the country, and even from abroad. Welcome. So I'm going to share uh, quickly uh, my presentation. It's going to be very short. I Hopefully you see my screen. Uh, what I want to do is um, present just you know, the, the, the vision and mission of CTF. Uh, my name is uh, Salvo La Rosa. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Foundation. And the Children's Tumor Foundation is, has been incorporated in 1978. Uh, our headquarters is in New York City. And as you know, we are the largest non-governmental funder of neurofibromatosis research. Our mission, though, is very broad. We don't just do research, even though it's our main item to drive research, but we also committed to expand knowledge and advance care for the neurofibromatosis community. Our vision is to eradicate the disease as we know, and we hope we'll do. Very quickly, I want to show you this, this picture to, to kind of um, show you the breadth of, 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 G, of CTF. As you can see here in this graph, there are patients at the center and you actually represent um, them. And this is where everything happens. But also around you, there are many stakeholders. There are clinics that are all around. Uh, there are you know, the research enterprise in the basic translational and clinical sector, but there are also pharma that are, you know, play a crucial role. And there are regulators like the FDA that also are important. But sometimes all of these entities are like disconnected, like different islands. What we see as our mission is to connect all of those together, starting from the patients and going back to the patients through, you know, intense connections so that we can connect clinics. We can catalyze the research, you know, and connect research through them. Also enabling the commercial entities like biotech and pharma to uh, move from bench to bedside, their discoveries, help regulators to deliver that. And we can only do this through, the, through your help, you know, with your help. So the patient engagement program that Trisen is bringing together is, is key with all of it. So it connects you through the clinics and, you know, allows them to understand what, what you really care, what, what are your needs. You also help us with, you know, looking at research, review the proposals that we assign every year. Now it's been a couple of years with we already engage in patients reviews as reviewers. We also, you know, help, you also help the commercial entities, the farm and biotech to understand what your needs are. And you also talk to the regulators to understand what we really need in a medicine. So it goes to start with you and ends with you. And every time we do this cycle, we learn something. You can see in blue all of the programs that CTF has been developing through the years. It's not the time to talk about them, but just for you to know what is in there. And with that, I will move and introduce um, Caleb, Dr. Caleb Yohe, a neurology specialist at NYU Langone. He specializes in caring for adults and children with an F. Caleb. Thanks, Salvo, and uh, welcome to everybody to the first virtual uh, NF forum. Um, I know some of you have been to forums, the, the live forums in the past. 
Um, for those of you who have not, um, welcome to your first forum and hope that uh, in future forums we get to meet you in person. Um, a few years ago, uh, the CTF decided to try to connect the forums with the uh, annual research meeting um, that uh, we uh, go to every year that's sponsored by uh, Children's Tumor Foundation. The research meeting is really one of the, the core foundational uh, aspects of the research and clinical community for neurofibromatosis. It brings everyone together, uh, all the scientists, all the clinicians, um, not just from the US, but even from around the world. And um, a few years ago, the, the, the forum, which is a, a patient uh, centered uh, meeting to uh, sort of update people on the latest information about neurofibromatosis, um, joined with the, the larger meeting, which was really exciting because it gave an opportunity for uh, patients and families to meet the scientists and clinicians who are working on this. Um, and it also gave an opportunity for, especially the scientists who may not actually um, see people with neurofibromatosis to meet some of the people that um, that have and live with neurofibromatosis on a daily basis. So this year we were going to do a, a special uh, forum uh, for the first time. It was going to be just neurofibromatosis type 1, and CTF was going to partner with, uh, with uh, our clinic at NYU uh, to put together a live forum at the end of August. And of course, everything changed uh, in March, and so uh, we've redesigned the forum of course, it's virtual, and we're, we're going to have several different sessions. Uh, but today's session is really uh, to try to recapitulate or to, to reenact that um, connection that I really thought was great uh, when patients were able to come to the, to the main meeting, um, which is a chance to actually meet some of the scientists that are doing this work and to hear directly from them what the exciting things that they're doing to, to understand NF. So tonight we're going to have uh, two moderators, um, and I'm, I'll introduce them in a minute, and we're going to have six separate presentations uh, by different scientists who are going to talk about the re work that they're doing um, in their clinics and in their labs. Um, and we're going to have an opportunity for you all to ask questions uh, and to speak to them via chat directly so that we can um, connect the scientists with the community. Um, so that, just by way of a background, that's what we're, we're doing tonight. Um, I also just wanted to spend just a minute or two talking about just some of the highlights of the scientific meeting um, that just happened uh, on June 15th and June 16th. Um, the meeting was a virtual meeting, uh, again, for the first time. Um, and it was a much shorter meeting than usual, so everything was sort of compacted. Um, but it was a very exciting meeting, and we, we heard a lot about uh, some uh, uh, a lot of the, the recent updates uh, in the care of people with NF and a lot of the uh, updates on the science. Um, a few of the highlights that I thought were really interesting, um, there was a discussion about how telemedicine uh, has taken off in the age of COVID and how many clinics have had to adapt very quickly to seeing patients um, via uh, uh, virtual visits, um, which should also translate, I think, into the future into improved access for people that live far away from NF clinics. Um, there was also discussion about how COVID has impacted NF care and research in terms of how it's delayed um, clinical trials and enrolling patients and, and collecting space specimens for analysis. Um, we also talked about how a lot of the guidelines that have been written, how well they are being taken up by the NF clinical care community, which was also a really important discussion. Um, one of the biggest areas of discussion at this meeting and also in the last couple of meetings was uh, the fact that the uh, diagnostic criteria for NF are being revised, and so there was more discussion about that. Um, and there was also a celebration and recognition that the NF1 gene was discovered 30 years ago, and uh, a little bit about the history between uh, the discovery of the gene 30 years ago and the, the approval of the first uh, FDA approved medication for the treatment of neurofibromatosis, specifically a drug called selumetinib, which you'll hear more about tonight, uh, to treat plexiform neurofibromas in, in children with NF. We also heard a lot of uh, exciting scientific presentations. Uh, 
um, some on the basic science end, some on the clinical science end, and we're going to hear some of the most exciting presentations tonight. Um, we heard a lot about MEK inhibitors and the role that they may play in treatment of plexiform neurofibromas, as well as other tumors associated with NF1, such as cutaneous neurofibromas, and how they may be involved in treating other aspects and other symptoms of NF. We heard about new animal models of NF, um, especially we heard about a new mini pig model that um, has been developed or two different mini pig models that have been developed uh, in conjunction with CTF that may allow better understanding of how different symptoms of NF develop and give us a better basis in which to test different potential uh, treatments for those symptoms. Um, we learned about uh, different aspects of the basic biology of NF and how different genetic mutations may cause different symptoms of NF. We also learned about the biology of, of the cognitive changes that we sometimes see with NF. I would say that the main theme of the, of the year, though, was really uh, MEK inhibitors. MEK inhibitors are a relatively new class of drugs, initially designed to, be treat, to treat cancer, uh, but based on uh, work that dates all the way back to discovering the gene 30 years ago, it was identified that these drugs may be effective in treating NF because of the pathway they uh, impact. And um, uh, so many of the papers that were discussed, a lot of the data that was discussed was ab about uh, the clinical trials that are ongoing or have recently completed, upcoming clinical trials, and upcoming ways in which these drugs might be adapted to be used in NF in a, in a variety of different ways. So overall, it was a shorter meeting than usual, but I think it was a really exciting meeting. Um, it's a really exciting time to be in the field of neurofibromatosis um, because so much is happening right now uh, in terms of our understanding of NF. And, and I really feel like for the first time in my career, I feel like we're on the cusp of uh, really having a variety of good and effective treatments for neurofibromatosis, which is, is really, really cool. So with that, I'm going to turn tonight's session over to our uh, two moderators. Um, uh, our first uh, moderator is Verena Stedke. She's a, uh, she has an MD and a PhD from Berlin. Uh, she is currently the director of the Pediatric NF Center, uh, or the Pediatric portion of the NF Center at Johns Hopkins, uh, where she's Associate Professor of Neurology. She actually uh, came to Hopkins um, uh, quite a while back now, I guess, uh, and did a fellowship there before going to Virginia to do her residency in pediatrics, uh, and then came back to neurology at Johns Hopkins as a pediatric neurologist, uh, where she has been since 2011. Um, she uh, works in the lab and has done some really great work. She's interested in, in understanding the mechanisms and, and developing novel treatments for NF, um, as well as for other malignant um, brain tumors. So we're excited to have her join us, um, particularly to address some of the more basic science issues and discussion that we'll have tonight. I'm also really uh, honored to introduce Bruce Korf as our uh, second moderator. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have uh, interacted with Dr. Korf at one point or another. Um, he is the Chief Genomics Officer at University of Alabama, and he has been at UAB um, initially at the, as a chair of the Department of Genetics since 2003. Um, prior to that, he was in uh, Boston uh, at Boston Children's, which is um, where I think he really got his start in the uh, field of NF. Um, I've known Bruce for a long time, and he really has uh, served as a model for me in terms of uh, clinical care of, of patients with NF, as well as uh, trying to understand the, the genetic underpinnings of, of the neurofibromatosis uh, disorders. So, very excited to have him here today as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce and Brina, and they will uh, lead the discussion with our six presenters tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks, Caleb. Um, so I think I will um, get us started introducing the first speaker, um, which is Karen Walsh. And she'll be speaking on the impact of MEK inhibitor therapy on neurocognitive functioning in children and adults with NF1.
Good evening. Thank you to the organizers for the NF Forum this year for inviting me to come and give you a brief summary of our research on MEK inhibitors and cognitive functions in NF1. As you all know, there are many cognitive and learning difficulties that as a community we continue to try to understand and certainly to find interventions and treatments that may be effective in uh, supporting kids learning and memory um, in NF1. We certainly know that overactivity in the RAS pathway in NF1 is involved in the presence of these cognitive difficulties. And there is uh, research in mice that suggests that MEK inhibition may impact cognition. So we decided this would be a good opportunity to study something new. Um, over the last several years, there were numerous studies going on using MEK inhibitors such as selumetinib uh, to treat plexiform neurofibromas in children and adults with NF1. So we saw this as a really great opportunity to study the cog potential cognitive impact of MEK inhibitors um, in these same patients and basically tag teamed onto these studies um, by adding our own cognitive aims uh, and, and cognitive study. So what we did is anyone that was going to be enrolled on one of the MEK inhibitor study to treat a plexiform neurofibroma uh, was approached to see if they were interested in also participating in our cognitive study. So those that were, um, were evaluated prior to starting the study drug. And then we did the same cognitive evaluation at three different time points over the first year of treatment. So these included a cognitive test that is done on the computer, a couple of tests actually, um, as well as a questionnaire called the BRIEF, which uh, evaluates somebody's functioning with, in terms of executive function in everyday life. Parents often complete them for children, and if we had adult participants, they completed these forms for themselves. But it gave us an indication of how someone uh, felt like and was functioning with regard to executive functions on a day-to-day -day basis. So we collected that information at all of these time points. So this is a summary of where we have ended up with this initial study. We had 59 patients complete all the time points. The average age of the participant in the study was about 12 and a half years old, um, but we had individuals as young as five and as old as 27 in the study, which was really guided by the main treatment studies and who was included in those. We had slightly more males in our uh, group for this particular study, and um, you can see the breakdown of race and ethnicity. And then finally, the majority of participants were in fact on selumetinib uh, versus some of the other MEK inhibitors, and this really just was based on the timing of the study and that the selumetinib study happened to be uh, the one that was recruiting the most individuals at that time. So, we want to look at what happened in terms of cognitive functions over that first year of treatment. So let me orient you a bit to this graph. Oh, there's a lot here to talk about. So these are scores here on this uh, y-axis. Um, and what we have in these first two sets of bar graphs are, uh, is the data from the brief. And this is the questionnaire that parents or adult uh, participants completed. Now, in this particular kind of um, uh, assessment, a higher score is, indicates that somebody's having more difficulty in these areas of cognitive and behavioral regulation. So if we see lower scores, that means somebody's reporting less difficulty or less problems. So what we'd want to see, this is um, over the time of the blue is the test data, the information from before treatment started, the purple is at the six-month uh, check-in, and the uh, green is a 12-month check-in. So we'd want on this particular set of graphs to see a, a downward trend in scores because that means that people were saying or reporting less difficulty. So that is what we see indeed, um, and that the changes from pre-treatment to six and 12 months for both of these sets was statistically significant, meaning it was enough of a change to be um, you know, to be unexpected or, or to be notable. 
Now the, the two bar graphs here are based on the computerized test that someone did in the clinic. So for this, higher scores indicate better performance. This is not really problem-based, it's a performance-based test. So you'd want to see a trend in the upward direction over this 12 months in this kind of data. So when we look at performance on the working memory task, we really just see pretty much stable performance. We don't see a whole lot of movement in either direction, and even this slight bump down is not significant. Um, and with visual learning, we see a trend in the direction that we would hope of improving scores over time, but in fact, this is not statistically significant. It's a pretty small increase in, in performance of the group. Um, so that, you know, we wouldn't make much of that at this, at this moment. So we don't get the same kinds of patterns here on the um, questionnaire data versus the performance data and that's something that we need to still try to understand and explore a bit more to see why that would be. I mean you certainly hope to see these the same outcome in both sets of data but we'll have to try to understand that as we look further at, at the information. So uh, this is data from the study as well but presented in a different way. We're still talking about these uh, questionnaire-based data as well as the top two bars are on the computerized performance data, the cognitive tests on the computer. But what we're presenting here is the percentage of the group that was in our study that either showed significant improvement by the time they got to the 12-month assessment, either or stayed the same, or showed some significant decline in performance or ratings over time. The bottom group here is your reference. So if nothing was happening, if nobody was, if somebody was not getting an intervention, we just had somebody do a test twice or do a rating scale twice, we expect that only 5% are gonna show a significant improvement it, from one time to the next, and 5% would show a significant decline just by chance. But most people, 90% of the group, was, should be the same at both time points. Now, we have, some type of intervention because all the participants on our study were in fact on a MEK inhibitor. Um, so when we look at the percentage of the group that showed improvement in that 12 month span for the brief data, these are these two bars here, 25% showed significant improvement in cognitive regulation, 15% in behavioral regulation. The good majority did stay stable. When we look at the computerized performance tests, we only get about two and a half percent that showed an improvement, a significant improvement in working memory, and seven and a half on visual learning. But again, the the bulk of the group remained the same or performed similarly to the first time, the pre-treatment um, assessment. So again, this is just another way to look at this data that's interesting to us um, and, and informative. So one other thing that we looked at um, is to see, did it matter if somebody had difficulties or impairment in these skills before they started the, the study? And or, you know, did that change what happened with them in the study? So this is only the cognitive regulation data because it's kind of where we see the most hints that maybe something could be happening. Um, so we, we kind of narrowed it down to this for the purpose of this presentation. But what we have here, this is again percentages. Green is improved, blue means stable or no change, and red means a decline in performance or rating. This is actually the rating data. Um, so in the patients who were rated as having impairments in cognitive regulation before they started the study, at 12 months, 71.4 of them showed significant improvement in cognitive regulation based on those reports. The other 28.6% stayed the same, and we had nobody show significant declines in performance in that time frame. In the patients that were not rated as impaired, did not really have particular difficulties in this area prior to the study, we still saw 15.6% of them improve significantly at 12 months. The bulk of the group stayed the same or was stable, and we had 6.3% uh, show a significant decline, which is in line with, remember, that reference group of 5%. Um, so that doesn't stand out as anything concerning to us. So just to summarize, I know this is a pretty quick summary of this study, but um, you know this is the first human trial of MEK inhibitors on cognitive outcomes in NF1, so we're very proud to uh, have gotten this going. Um, 
what I think we can say with confidence at this point is that in that at least the first year on a MEK inhibitor, particularly selumetinib, we are not finding information that suggests there's neurotoxicity, um, which means an imp impact on a neurologic function, cognitive function um, that's detrimental to patients. So that is, is really important finding of the study. And I would say that we at least have some indication from this data that we should look at this further, that we should do more research on MEK inhibitors and cognitive functions. Um, we do not have enough evidence to suggest that this right now is a primary treatment for cognitive dysfunction in NF1. Um, we could not say that with the information we have, but we do have enough information to make us interested in doing more research. In fact, we do have plans and there's already another study ongoing um, in patients with NF1 and brain uh, tumors um, that we will be looking at in the same way. And I would say that, you know, what we do see here is that those with pretreatment impairments show greater improvement over that 12 months, which would be expected. And in essence, if you don't have difficulties in an area, we might not expect that you're going to improve significantly with, with any kind of intervention per se. Um, so that made sense, but was an important finding for us because my time is up. Um, this was a really major group effort to carry this out with lots of support from my colleagues and friends, not only at Children's National where I work, but at the National Cancer Institute and NIH and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then of course the funding from the Children's Tumor Foundation and the Gilbert Family Foundation were imperative in allowing us to, to carry this out. Um, so I thank you for your time, and I think we're going to open up for questions here in a moment. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Um, a few questions have come in um, the chat, and I'll try to um, um, summarize a few of them. Um, there are a few questions that get to the issue of um, whether MEK inhibitors like selumetinib would be appropriate to use in treatment of cognitive function. So I think one question was, clarifying that um, you were really treating tumors, not cognitive function, and this was more or less of an add-on study. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we, there certainly is not evidence at this point, as I sort of said in one of these final slides, that we would use a MEK inhibitor primarily to treat cognitive dysfunction. I mean, we certainly hope that there could be an effect there, but we do not have that kind of information. So the next study that's actually already started is actually through the Children's Oncology Group, and um, that is in children with um, gliomas, and they're, they, there's a randomized study, so some of the kids will get selumetinib as a treatment, and some will get more of the standard care right now, which is vincristine and uh, carboplatin. And so that's, a, that's an important next step, because this study is a single arm, meaning everyone was on, on a MEK inhibitor, so there's no comparison there. So that limits our data to some extent, certainly, and, and I think we have to be um, cautious. You know, this first study was really just to determine if this there is something more to study, and I think we saw at least enough of a of a signal or a hint that there could be something there that we are interested in continuing. So that's exactly right. We wouldn't we wouldn't be generating a study or starting a study right now where the primary aim was to treat cog cognitive deficits and using a MEK inhibitor. And I, you know, I think some of the questions also get to the you know how long can you be on a MEK inhibitor and what are the side effects? And that may not be totally known, but I, what do you think in terms of um, the um, durability of, of the effects? Um, if you did see improvement, would you predict that these would persist if the person came off the medication or are these likely to be uh, to revert if they came off the medication? Yeah, I really don't think we can answer that particular question at the moment. What we did see in the data over that 12-month period is that, you know, and why you didn't see any data from the three months is we really didn't see anything going on with the data at three months. We started to see if, the, if people were going to be either reporting or demonstrating some improvement. We started to see that at the six-month time point, and, but we saw additional benefit by 12 months. So it looks like this perhaps could be something that takes some time um, to the point of if they stop the MEK inhibitor or we're not on it any longer, you know, how long would these potential effects last? I think we don't have a way to answer that yet. The next study, again, 
will give us some more information on that. We're following um, individuals on that study out longer um, and even to a time point when they wouldn't be on the MEK inhibitor anymore. So hopefully we'll be able to answer A, if this is actually effective for cognition and B, if so, you know, what, what that looks like for the longer term. Great, thank you. Um, there are a few other questions, but I'm afraid we're gonna need to move on, um, but they're in the chat and, and you could probably monitor those and maybe answer them in the chat. Yeah, sure thing. I'll jump over there and try to answer as many as I can. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up is Christina Hardy. We are going to remain on the theme of cognitive um, issues in NF1 right now. Um, Christina is going to talk on treating cognitive deficits in neurofibromatosis type 1, efficacy of computerized cognitive training. Hi. On behalf of our multinational research team, I'd like to thank the CTF Forum for the opportunity to talk about this research project. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the Department of Defense, who awarded us a grant to fund the project, as well as generous support from the Gilbert Family Neurofibromatosis Institute at Children's National Hospital. I'll be describing the preliminary results of the research study that we've been conducting for the last several years at my institution in Washington, DC, at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and at hospitals in both Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. I also wanted to mention that we've had to pause most of the activities in the study during the COVID pandemic, so I'll be presenting the results from an almost complete sample. We don't expect the results to look very different when we finish our data collection, but there's always a ways that we don't expect. So what are we studying? Although we know that children with NF are more likely to experience some difficulties with their thinking and learning, we're still exploring interventions to help. A lot of children receive accommodations and support at school when they have these problems, but those types of services really only make it a bit easier to be a student with learning challenges. They don't fix attention and memory and thinking issues. Because of this, our team has been looking for strategies that may help children with NF actually improve their thinking. And this study aimed to determine if a cognitive training program called COGMED can help improve attention and memory skills in children with NF1. So what did the intervention look like? The main intervention we're studying is called COGMED, as I said. This is a computerized cognitive training program designed to increase working memory capacity. Working memory is the kind of thinking skill that children and adults use when we try to keep a small amount of information in our mind for a short amount of time while we're doing it, like calculating the tip for your server at a restaurant. CogMed helps kids practice working memory skills using a video game-like format with a space and robot theme, like you can see here. Kids train at home on a computer or a tablet device, and they get support from a CogMed coach who calls to check in on how things are going once a week. Because this is a research study, we chose to have some children complete a different at-home program so we could make sure that children's working memory skills weren't improved just by doing any work on a computer. The other program is called MobyMax, and MobyMax is an online reading program that pairs short stories with reading comprehension questions. So who's participating? In this study, children can participate if they have NF1, are between 8 and 16 years old, and can use a computer or a tablet by themselves. Families also have to speak English because, unfortunately, none of our CogMed coaches speaks another language fluently enough to offer it to families who speak a different language. The other requirements we have for the study is that there is an adult available to help the children when they're doing their training, and that children either be taking no medication for ADHD or that they're on a stable dose of medication when they join. Because ADHD medication can also change working memory skills, we wanted to make sure that children weren't doing anything else that could change their working memory skills during the study besides training. Okay, so what happens during the study? When a family is interested in participating, the child will first complete a screening visit. We're looking for two things in the screening visit. First, we want to make sure there isn't any reason that participating in this study would be harmful for children, either physically or mentally. The second thing we want to do in the screening visit is to see if the child has working memory problems, which means if they do, they qualify for the intervention part of the study. Children who qualify are randomly assigned to either complete a CogMed or MobyMax. 
because we're interested in seeing whether children who are taking ADHD medication might have a different response to training than those who aren't taking any medication, we first divide the participants into two groups, on medication and not taking medication, before we randomly assign them to one of the interventions. This is just so we're more likely to have equal groups in the end. And finally, after they complete the assigned intervention, families are asked to return for a short follow-up visit where they'll do some of the same tasks they completed in the screening visit to see if their skills improved. So what are our results? So far, 93 children have completed the screening assessments at our four sites. Um, on average, children are 11 when they participate, but we've had children at all ages between 8 and 16. Our sample is split pretty evenly between boys and girls, and we've been really pleased that our sample is racially and ethnically diverse. About 80% of the children who completed screening assessments showed working memory difficulties, and we um, divided them evenly between both interventions. Okay, so how did children and families do with the training programs? As you might expect, we had very few reports of problems that were associated with either cognitive training program. 90% um, of the children never or rarely experienced physical pain or discomfort. And the most commonly reported events were frustration and boredom, at least some of the time, which we feel is pretty consistent with doing things like homework or chores. Finally, the majority of children reported that they often or always enjoyed completing the exercises, and most parents um, were somewhat or very satisfied with their child's participation in the study. Okay, so, um, so far we've just looked at a, at a few of the test results. What we see so far is encouraging though. When we look at figure one on the left, we see the scores of the children on short-term memory and working memory tasks after training. What we see is that children who completed CogMed in blue have higher scores on all the tasks than those who completed Mobimax, though the only difference um, that is larger than we would expect by chance is on a verbal working memory task. In figure two, we're just looking at the scores for the children who completed CogMed. The scores before training are in blue and the scores after training are in green. Again, we see here that all of the green bars are higher than the blue ones, which tells us that on average, children are doing better on these tasks after training and that improvement is better than chance on both verbal working memory and visual short-term memory tasks. So what can we conclude so far? Our results suggest that home-based computerized cognitive training programs like CogMed are relatively enjoyable and easy to use for children with NF1 and their families. This program also appears to be helpful at improving at least some short-term memory and working memory skills. What we still don't know is if the training will lead to changes in how children with NF1 do tasks in everyday life. Still, we're encouraged by these early results and hope that by improving children's thinking and learning, we may even be able to improve their academic success and quality of life. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see, there is a qu couple of questions that have come in. Um, I'll, I'll read this one. It says, one speaker at a previous meeting was talking about fruit flies, was able to make male fruit flies display a wing dipping behavior by mutating the NF1 gene. The question is whether human brains are more flexible, could such a genetically induced behavior be worked around? What you're talking about now, cognitive training, seems like a workaround that depends on flexibility of the human brain. Um, any thoughts in this context? Can we train around cognitive impairment or are we as stuck as a fruit fly? So this is a great question, and I remember the talk that you are mentioning. Um, and um, even though I certainly think there's probably a lot of difference between the, the phenotype or what fruit flies look like in their behavior, even when they have a similar mutation um, as the NF1 gene, um, we really think about the same things. Um, as a, a neuropsychologist, I believe that the brain is flexible and can absolutely change what we have to do, I think, is probably do a little bit more than have children practice the skills that they're doing in CogMed. I do think that's going to be helpful in improving working memory skills, but I have a hunch that we're also going to have to help kids learn how to apply those skills in their real world. So in other words, we're 
they're going to practice so they kind of um, get the the parts of their brain that are helping them with working memory to be stronger. And then we're going to have to give them some structure and support on how to use those new skills in their real world settings. So I think it's probably going to be a two part approach and that next part training kids on how to use those skills flexibly in their real life is probably going to be our next project. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, I think one other question. Has this particular cognitive training approach already been studied in kids who don't have NF1? Yeah, that's a great question also. Um, it's been studied a lot, and it's been studied most often in children who have attention deficit disorder without out any medical condition. And um, we're seeing similar results um, as children who have trained who have ADHD. Again, with a little bit of concern that the skills we see, we can measure improvement on the tasks that we give in our neuropsychology battery. But what we really care about is that kids are doing better in school. There was a study that came out um, very recently um, that looked at CogMed training in a very large group of children, school-aged children with attention deficit disorder in Germany. And what this group of people did is follow these children for about a year after they finished training. And what they observed was that there were changes in children's uh, school um, performance and home behavior. So in other words, some of those skills got better over time. And this is really consistent with what we think might happen. If you train working memory skills, it's gonna take a while for kids to figure out how to apply those skills in everyday life and for those skills to then have an impact on their um, academics and on the way that they manage their tasks every day. Great. Well, thanks very much. I think we're going to need to um, move on to our next speaker now, um, which is Geraldine O'Sullivan Coyne, sure. and we're going to come back to MEK inhibitor, um, phase two trial of the MEK 1-2 inhibitor solumetinib in adults with neurofibromatosis type 1 and inoperable plexiform neurofibromas. Thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to share today some of the results of our ongoing phase two trial of selumetinib, a MEK1 and 2 inhibitor in adults with neurofibromatosis type 1 or NF1 and inoperable plexiform neurofibromas or PNs. My name is Geraldine O'Sullivan Coyne and I'm a medical oncologist at the Developmental Therapeutics Clinic at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. These are my disclosures. I know this audience is very familiar with NF1 as a genetic tumor predisposition syndrome that is characterized by the activation of the RAS pathway. NF1 is also associated with the formation of plexiform neurofibromas that are histologically benign nerve sheath tumors. Many PNs occur in very young children and can cause significant and life-threatening morbidities, which often worsen over time and affect adulthood. In addition, up to 15% of these tumors will transform to the highly aggressive malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Here I am showing some of the images and the MRIs of a patient of the pediatric oncology branch at NCI who had a progressive large inoperable left neck, chest and arm PN causing pain, loss of function in his arm and massive disfigurement. And this disease has been the subject of a number of clinical trials to date. Here on this slide is a cartoon of the RAS pathway. When this pathway is activated, it stimulates tumor production and growth. NF1 causes a mutation in the neurofibromin protein, which usually inactivates RAS. When neurofibromin is mutated, it can no longer engage or inactivate RAS, and other proteins in that pathway, including RAF and MEK, also become very active, leading to tumor formation. It is a little bit like a light switch. The neurofibroma community believe that blocking this particular pathway, the RAS pathway, is important to control the disease. And this has been the rationale behind testing selumetinib, which is an oral MEK inhibitor, in pediatric patients. Selumetinib has recently received approval 
for NF1 related inoperable symptomatic PNs in pediatric patients, specifically between the ages of 2 and 18 years. Given this background, I wanted to share some of the results of our ongoing study of selumetinib in adults with NF1 and PN. The primary objective of this study is to determine the response rate as measured by MRI and volumetric analysis. But there are a number of secondary objectives, including the effect of selumetinib on pain, quality of life, and other aspects of physical functioning that we're capturing. Patients that are ages 18 and older with NF1 and an inoperable PN that is causing morbidity are eligible and we administer selumetinib by mouth in a continuous dosing fashion, meaning that we give it without interruption. These MRIs that evaluate response are performed every four cycles for the first two years, and after that, after every six cycles of therapy. This slide shows how we assess PNs. As you can see, once we determine which is the target PN at baseline, we are then able to determine what kind of tests we should do. So for example, if a patient has motor compromise from their target PN, we can carry out certain strength or range of motion evaluations. All patients have photography performed routinely on the trial, and all patients also have pain and quality of life assessments that are carried out at a number of time points on the study. This study also requires biopsies, and we carry these out at baseline before the drug starts and after two to three cycles of therapy with selumetinib. None of the pediatric trials had biopsies performed, and these biopsies help us to understand what happens inside the tumor with treatment. You can see here that these are performed by a specialist radiologist under conscious sedation, and we have a number of patients that have also had a matching cutaneous neurofibroma biopsy performed by a dermatologist. These are some of the baseline characteristics of the 27 patients that have been enrolled so far on the trial. The median age is 33, though it ranges from 18 to 60, and we have a predominance of male patients on the trial. PNs are classified by the way they appear on MRI, and the majority of target PNs have been typical PNs. The median volume of tumors has been a little over one liter, but we have enrolled patients with smaller and significantly larger tumors. We also have additional information coming from the biopsies of these PN, where we can now subclassify them depending on what the histology result is. And we also have approximately half of patients that have had a matching cutaneous neurofibroma biopsy. Baseline morbidities for our adult patients most commonly have been pain, motor and disfigurement changes, as you can see here. We've also had a number of patients that have enrolled that are confined to a wheelchair. Approximately 50% of our patients have achieved a partial response on study and these have been durable, as noted by the confirmed status here. A number of patients have had stable disease, but we haven't had anybody whose disease has progressed on the trial to date. Here on the right, I'm showing you a sample of both the MRI images and matching photography for one of our patients enrolled on trial. And you can see the heavy burden of the plexiform at baseline and the changes that have occurred approximately over one year. Between baseline and pre-cycle 13, or again one year, patient reported target tumor pain intensity and pain interference scores significantly improved. And we haven't seen any significant change in strength or range of motion of the target PN to date within that time, but this analysis is ongoing. This is a waterfall plot that shows the best response for all of the evaluable patients that were enrolled on the study. A shrinkage of 20% in comparison to the baseline size of the tumor is the criteria for partial response. You can see here that all of the different subtypes of plexiform neurofibromas that were enrolled are separated by color here. And it shows you the magnitude of benefit that the different groups have had from selumetinib. Lastly, I'd like to share some of the safety and tolerability of selumetinib on trial so far. The majority of adverse events were in keeping with those that have been seen in the pediatric studies and in earlier trials. The majority of them are asymptomatic and can be managed without dose reduction. The first two patients on trial were treated at 75 milligrams, but were dose reduced to 50 milligrams, and we subsequently have treated everybody else at 50 milligrams. Of these, four patients required a dose reduction, and two of these patients required a second dose reduction. In summary, Selumetinib therapy yields improved patient-reported pain intensity in adults with NF1 and PNs. 
It's safe and well tolerated and has evidence of clinical benefit and objective response in adults, and these responses are durable. Finally, I would very much like to acknowledge and thank all of the patients and their families that have partnered with us in this trial. As you can see, this has been a collaborative effort across a number of groups. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one quick question. I don't know if this is such a quick question, really, but um, why MEK inhibitors? Is there um, experience with other inhibitors in the RAS pathway? Any idea why MEK inhibitors work particularly well? And that is definitely not a, um, a short question with regards to its answer. There certainly have been other MEK inhibitors that have been evaluated. Perhaps selumetinib at this point is the one that has um, a, a bigger volume of uh, literature and clinical experience so far. That doesn't mean, however, that other parts of the RAS pathway may not be amenable to a, a similar effect if manipulated at other levels. That data is not really there um, yet. Um, so I think probably the MEK inhibition, um, specifically with sevimetinib, probably is what has the uh, biggest bulk of the experience so far. But there are a number of trials looking at other MEK inhibitors um, that hopefully will also yield some additional information. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, I am now going to turn um, the um, moderating over to Verena. Great. And we are continuing with MEK inhibitors. The next talk will be from Dr. Kavita Sareen from Stanford University Medical Center. And she will talk about the development of topical MEK inhibitors for the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas in NF1. I'm excited to share with you a new program from Inflection Therapeutics to develop a topical MEK inhibitor for the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas. Here are my disclosures. Cutaneous neurofibromas are benign skin tumors thought to arise from small nerves of the skin. The majority of adults with NF1 have greater than 100 neurofibromas throughout their body. These neurofibromas can cause social anxiety, itching, and pain. The Reigns Cutaneous Neurofibroma Working Group conducted a survey of 548 individuals in the CTF NF1 registry. Nearly 60% of individuals reported being very much or extremely bothered by features of the cutaneous neurofibromas. Despite this need, there are not a lot of good therapies, and treatments are mainly surgical excision and laser ablation, both which can result in scarring and have high risk of recurrence. MEK inhibitors are a promising therapy for cutaneous neurofibromas. Cutaneous neurofibromas are driven by uncontrolled activation of a cell growth pathway called the RAS pathway due to loss of a gene called neurofibromin. MEK inhibitors block MEK downstream of RAS and inhibit activation of ERK and the overactivated cell growth pathway. There are a number of reasons why we believe this approach will work for cutaneous neurofibromas. One reason is that it works for other NF1-driven tumors. The MEK inhibitor selumetinib was approved last month for the treatment of inoperable plexiform neurofibromas in children with NF1. This is a photograph from a trial publication of a 10-year-old boy with a plexiform neurofibroma on his right neck. This is the pretreatment tumor, and this is the post-treatment tumor. The tumor shrank almost 40% after one year of treatment, and this is a breakthrough for NF1 and highlights the potential of MEK inhibitors to treat NF1-related tumors. Despite this, MEK inhibitors have toxicities that limit chronic use. These include reduced heart failure, lung inflammation, kidney failure, diarrhea in 40%, and rash in over half of the patients treated. This is a photo from one of our patients who developed a classic widespread rash seen with the MEK inhibitor trametinib. Inflection's objective is to develop a top soft or metabolically unstable MEK inhibitor that can penetrate into target tissue and treat the cutaneous neurofibroma, but is rapidly metabolized when it hits the circulation with negligible systemic exposure. This approach enables the delivery of large amounts of drug to the targeted cutaneous neurofibroma with minimal systemic side effects. To identify this drug, Inflection undertook an extensive discovery program. The ideal soft MEK inhibitor was designed balancing three factors. It had to be permeable to penetrate through the skin and enter the neurofibroma tissue. 
It had to have high potency and had to be soft or metabolically unstable and be rapidly removed from the circulation to limit systemic exposure and side effects. From this extensive screen, uh, emerged our lead compound, NFX-179. NFX-179 is rapidly metabolized in minutes. It's highly potent, well in the range of established MEK inhibitors, and it has a half-life in blood of less than an hour, limiting systemic exposure. To assess whether our lead compound could penetrate and suppress RAS pathway activation in human cutaneous neurofibromas, we developed an ex vivo human neurofibroma explant assay. The cutaneous neurofibroma was excised and dissected into two millimeter by two millimeter fragments and submerged in media with the surface exposed to air. A gel formulation of the drug was added to the surface of the neurofibroma and the sample was collected four, after, four hours after treatment. At collection, the sample was transected again into a superficial portion labeled S and a deep portion D and phospho ERK levels were assessed. Phospho ERK, again, is a biomarker of RAS pathway activation. This is a Western blot for phospho ERK, and this band is phospho ERK. The vehicle treated samples have the expected phospho ERK activation in both the superficial and deep portions of the neurofibroma. Treatment with a 1% gel and FX179 suppressed phospho ERK signaling in both the superficial and deep portions of the neurofibroma. This demonstrates that NFX179 gel can penetrate the human skin, enter the target neurofibroma, and inhibit RAS signaling. We also took a sample for immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry is a technique that allows us to visualize phospho-ERK staining on a cellular level. The phospho-ERK staining is brown, and you can see it in the neurofibroma tumor. After treatment with NFX-179, phospho-ERK is fully suppressed. NFX-179 is ready to enter clinical trials this summer. We have designed a lead compound with high potency against MEK, but highly labeled in plasma with a half-life of less than one hour to minimize systemic adverse side effects. We have demonstrated that NFX-179 suppresses phospho ERK in cell lines, in mini pig skin, in murine skin, and as I showed you today, in human neurofibroma explants. Our toxicology studies demonstrate negligible systemic toxicity in rat, mini pig, and in vitro studies and the IND was accepted on June 5th and is entering clinical trials this summer. And on this slide, I have the uh, likely and confirmed clinical trial sites for the first trial. I'd like to end with an acknowledgement to the entire Inflection team and Stanford team and to our funders that made this work possible. There are um, a few questions that were submitted. One is a follow-up question to the prior talk. And the question is if other topical inhibitors in that RAS pathway have been tried and how does their efficacy compare to the topical MEK inhibitor? Yeah, so I think um, this, the question of targeting uh, RAS or ERK, which is MAP-K, um, in, is a, is a, so targeting RAF is a holy grail, right, of treatment. Everyone is trying to target uh, RAF and, and, and upstream. And uh, I think, you know, pharmacal transferases to target RAS, I think, are, are a reasonable approach. Targeting upstream um, may, uh, in many cases, lead to increased resistance development. Um, targeting downstream ERK, so there are new therapies that are targeting ERK um, downstream. I think that's a very reasonable approach as well and may actually be subjected to less resistance or may be able to target uh, tumors or lesions that have developed resistance, upstream resistance to other, tumor, to other inhibitors. So I think uh, those are great approaches and they are um, also being heavily investigated and there are new therapies um, that target ERK uh, in development right now. Um, uh, we have not compared those. Uh, we've really focused on uh, MEK. MEK you, know, you, can, you can make highly specific allosteric inhibitors to MEK that don't cross-react with other kinases, um, which really provides a huge advantage um, for MEK, and the MEK inhibitors tend to be highly potent, which is also a huge advantage for targeting MEK. Mm -hmm. Maybe like uh, two more very quick questions, um, you know, that is of interest uh, to the broader community. Do you think this compound could be also used to prevent cutaneous neurofibromas or only as a treatment for ones that already exist? Yeah, I think that and we saw some beautiful work um, by Piotr at the uh, NF1 conference last week, um, really demonstrating in a mouse model system that topical uh, MEK inhibitors can prevent 
uh, the formation of cutaneous neurofibromas. So I do believe that that would be a very uh, interesting and important application as well. Okay, great. And then the very last question is focusing on the clinical trial, which is very exciting. And uh, patients are interested to understand like how they can get involved in the clinical trial and how long it could potentially take to a uh, regulatory approval for such a medication. Yeah, so this first trial is a phase 2A trial, and it's actually a biomarker trial. So it's a 28-day long trial. Um, uh, you can uh, learn more about the trial on clinicaltrials.gov, and if you just type in NFX179 or cutaneous neurofibroma, you'll get to the trial, and the trials, it'll list the trial sites as well for enrollment. Um, and this 28-day trial is going to enroll patients with um, six or more cutaneous neurofibromas, at least one on the face, and um, you would have to be willing to get all six tumors removed at the end of the trial, because we don't expect in one month necessarily to have complete resolution of the tumor um, by, the, by the drug. Um, but after this, of course, this is just the first phase of another trial. It would require um, a much larger multi-center trial um, before approval. So it typically takes years. Um, you know, we're very excited to see it in the clinic, but uh, unfortunately, though, you know, there's, for safety purposes and for clinical efficacy purposes, we need uh, much larger clinical efficacy trials uh, uh, before approval uh, and, and, and the drug is available. Great. Thank you so much for an exciting talk. I think in the interest of time, we'll have to move on with the next presenter, which is Paul Jones from the Washington University of St. Louis. He will be talking about liquid biopsy detection of MPNSTs and plexiform neurofibromas in NF1 patients using a new technology called cell-free DNA. Awesome. First of all, I'd like to thank CTF for the opportunity to present today. I am Paul Jones. I'm a second year graduate student in the lab of Abel Chowdhury here at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm actually quite new to this research and really just learned about NF1 about a year ago with the help of Angela Herbie, a fantastic physician scientist also here at WashU. I'm going to introduce a topic that has been applied to other conditions and cancers, but hasn't been extensively looked at in the context of NF1 or malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors namely liquid biopsies of plasma DNA. As we're all probably well aware, NF1 is a cancer predisposition disorder, meaning that individuals with NF1 are at an elevated risk for multiple different cancers seen here. Plasma DNA, which I'm going to talk about later, can be utilized to assess all of these types of cancers, but I'm going to focus on malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, or MPNSTs, which have a lifetime risk for NF1 individuals of between 8 and 13%. I'm going to focus on them for a few particular reasons. They have a poor five-year survival rate, have limited response to various treatments, and have a high probability of recurrence. Most notably, the only curative treatment is complete surgical resection. It is well established that most MPNSTs arise from benign plexiform neurofibromas, but there's growing evidence that many MPNSTs in the context of NF1 arise from intermediate atypical neurofibromas. Benign plexiform neurofibromas are diagnostic for NF1 and occur between 25 and 50 percent of individuals. Recent work has shown that distinct atypical neurofibromas appear to be in the intermediates with distinctive features on imaging and on biopsy. While there are apparent differences between these three types of tumors, false positives and negatives are oft often occur, potentially leading to unnecessary surgery or late diagnosis. Differential diagnosis is crucial as five-year event-specific survival for treated atypical neurofibroma patients is near 100%. Additionally, there appear to be genetic alterations seen here on our bottom that appear to demarcate each subtype. When we looked at one patient over time, we only saw the loss of that P53 gene only found in MPNSTs in the most advanced types of tumors. What we can conclude at this point is that there appear to be overlapping features between MPNSTs, atypical neurofibromas, and plexiform neurofibromas, but genetic features may be allowed differentiating between these types of tumors. Liquid biopsies utilize patient biofluids, typically blood plasma, to characterize genetic events that may be present in tumors. Within patient plasma, there is a very small component that is derived from tumor and retains the same genetic alterations in tumor. Currently in other cancers, liquid biopsies has multiple functions, including profiling mutations at the primary established tumor, identifying minimal residual disease after surgery, and monitoring treatment response. Another more challenging yet ideal goal is early cancer detection and screening. Given the high risk for malignancy for NF1 patients, 
tests and overlapping features on imaging and biopsy, the development of a liquid biopsy with the aim of early MPNST detection is ideal. We propose that we can detect genetic alterations in MPNST and effectively differentiate them from plex form neurofibroma using liquid biopsy. As stated before, genetic alterations are present in MPNST. On the left here, we have some of the most frequent locations of genetic alterations across MPNSTs. On our right, we have um, one particular patient assessing their MPNST tissue, blood plasma, and blood cell DNA. As can be seen, substantial genetic alteration was present in tumor and in plasma, but not in blood cells, where most plasma DNA is derived. Plasma DNA was also able to detect the genetic alteration at the CDK N2A, which is a, involved in the early formation of MPNST. Next, we quantified that genetic alteration as a tumor fraction from plasma for all our patients and, and compared to Plexform and MPNST. We first assessed six NF1 negative individuals and saw no identifiable tumor fraction. As can be seen, even Plexform patients had some elevated fra tumor fraction. However, when Plexform and MPNST patients were compared, there was a distinct and significant difference in tumor fraction. When we performed further analysis, we had a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 96% in detecting and differentiating MPNSTs from flex forms. Taken together, this indicates that plasma DNA effectively differentiates MPNSTs from flex forms. With further validation, this would provide strong support that tumor fraction from plasma may be diagnostic for MPNST diagnosis. I'm going to spotlight one MPNST case that explains how plasma DNA can help inform treatment decisions. In this case, we have an NF1 positive female in her mid 30s who was diagnosed with a primary MPNST in her left pelvis without any metastasis. When we looked at her imaging, tumor size remained about the same through, through her treatment. However, using liquid biopsy, we noticed a substantial decrease in tumor fraction during both radiation and chemotherapy. After tumor removal, this patient remained disease-free for 180 days at our last follow-up. We are continuing to monitor this patient and look to provide updates in the future. The last few things about what we want to do in the future. Obviously, we'd like to expand this current study. To, to do that, we need plasma samples from Plexform and MPNST patients, ideally with low disease burden. Most of our patients have fairly advanced disease, or most of our MPNST patients have fairly advanced disease. This, will, again, would provide further evidence that tumor fraction from blood plasma effectively distinguishes MPNST from Plexform. Next, we would like to assess those atypical neurofibromas. To do this, we would need plasma and tumor samples from atypical neurofibromas, ideally, again, with low disease burden. This would allow yeah, atypical over. neurofibromas non-invasively and uh, uh, potentially allow for the aggressive treatment of those atypical neurofibromas, improving patient outcomes. Lastly, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this. Adol Chowdhury, my fantastic mentor, uh, Jeff Chermansky, who did help me with all, a lot of this analysis, and also Angela Harvey, who introduced me to this disease. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much um, for the presentation. And uh, we received a few questions um, that were of big interest. And um, one of them was, is there a correlation between the plasma DNA levels you found and the total tumor burden in patients? Uh, yes, I actually do have a figure with that. It's pretty it's a good, strong correlation, but I cut it out from this presentation just for time. But yeah, there is a correlation. Okay. And using your very new methods, how many MPNSTs were you able to successfully predict and how many were not identified using the liquid biopsy? I think currently we had 42 of our plex, 42 or 41 of our plex form firms were determined to be plex form rather than MPNST. And the MPNSTs, I believe we had eight or nine. Uh, so eight were called correctly, one was missed. So that's where we're at right now. Okay, okay, perfect. And um, one other question from a, pa from a patient was whether you could use the genetic information obtained during the testing, whether this could be helpful in also determining um, a phenotype, genotype correlation in terms of a predisposition to MPNSTs in the future, basically prior to their development, like, you know, like identifying among all the plexiform neurofibromas, the one that is at high risk or the one patient that has that high risk? 
I think that's totally doable. I don't know. I think it would probably be better to do germline testing in that case and then do um, some longitudinal correlation analysis, basically determine if there are certain gen genotypes of NF1 that are more prone to uh, MPNSDs. I believe that NF1 microdeletions are at a higher risk for MPNST development, but I don't know if that's been fleshed out as much. And given the huge variety of different NF1 mutations that lead to neurofibromatosis, uh, that'd be challenging, but definitely interesting to do. Yeah, I think one other interesting um, thing would be, you know, is right now you're looking at the data from an early diagnostic standpoint. One other option perhaps would be using those new data to, for example, monitor the therapeutic response of these tumors to drugs. Do you think that this is something that could be feasible in the future to determine whether a medication does work for a tumor or it doesn't? Uh, yes, I think that's probably the more promising thing to do, at least in the short term. Early diagnosis is really hard to do, and I don't think anyone has done it in any types of cancers. It's one of the more immediate and probably more probable um, uses of this technology would be one to track treatment response. So if you, rather than having to go get an MRI every, or an MRI or a CT scan every few months, you go in every two weeks, get a blood draw and see if you're responding to treatment more effectively. And it would be cheaper in that way. The other thing that I think this is probably the first thing that we could do is look for minimal residual disease. So you go through your treatment, you have your tumor excised, and then you, and in, this would be in it, obviously in addition to current imaging, um, but you could also have very regular um, blood draws to assess if there's any potential tumor that may be still there or yeah. may have spread. Right, right. I would also imagine that you perhaps could be, would be able to determine much earlier whether a medication is potentially working in that you would expect tumors that, you know, respond to treatment perhaps shed more ctDNA into the blood versus tumors that may not, may, may not have that effect. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. yeah. The biology there makes sense. But I, again, I, Right. I haven't explored that, that yet, but I think it's a good idea to look at it in the future. And is there still an opportunity for patients to participate in that study if patients are interested in donating blood for you guys to do that? Uh, we're collecting uh, plasma and blood samples ongoing. Um, I, can, I can post in the chat the best way to, uh, contact, to contact us to see if uh, you'd be able to do donate. The, I would have to, do, again, look through all of our forms about that. But yes, I, we're continuing to collect blood plasma on our patients. Great. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, we have to move on. Plus, please feel free to you know, answer any uh, questions in the chat. And we are moving on to our very last speaker for the day, which will be um, Julia Nikrat. And Julia will be presenting her work about the use of oncolytic adenovirus as a therapy for malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I am thrilled to be able to share some of my work with you. I'm Julia Nikrad. I'm a graduate student at the University of Minnesota in the David Lagospada's lab. And I work on oncolytic adenoviruses as a potential therapy for malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Now, this work is in collaboration with another lab at the U, Dr. Masada Yamamoto. So first, let me tell you why we believe that oncolytic viruses are worth exploring as a therapy for MPNSD. Number one, oncolytic adenoviruses have not yet been tested for MPNSD, even though they're a major class of oncolytic viruses. Here you can see the globally clinical trials that have been performed that used some kind of virus. Out of all these clinical trials, almost 20% or yellow slice were adenoviruses. And if you looked at the indications that are being addressed by these clinical trials, cancer is a number one indication by far, again in yellow. Second, oncolytic viruses can affect tumor in several different ways. Through direct tumor lysis, where the virus gets into the tumor cell, replicates within it, and kills it, releases its viral progeny that can then go on to infect other neighboring tumor cells. And another way it can affect tumor is through mobilization of the immune system against the tumor. And so immune cells can then 
infiltrate into the tumor area and mount anti-tumor response. Okay, just a quick overview of structure and characteristics of adenoviruses so that you can understand why we think it's a really nice virus to work with for oncolytic purposes. It's a non-enveloped virus with a linear double-stranded DNA genome. Non-enveloped just means it, may, it has protein coat that surrounds its genetic material. So you can see that in yellow highlight. And the genetic material here is represented by the central squiggly black line. So that's the DNA. It replicates episomally biolytic cycle, which means it does not insert its DNA into the host cell genome, so no permanent alterations of the host cell genome. And lytic cycle just means it kills the cells upon it binds to the host cell via its fiber knob domain. Fiber knob domain uh, sticks to the cell surface molecules on the human cells, and they can be relatively easily modified in the lab to preferentially stick to cancer cells compared to non-cancer cells. So here you can see the workflow for an experiment that determined that these viruses in fact do bind better to cancer cells compared to non-cancer cell controls. So basically we seed the cancer cells or non-cancer cell controls into these multi-well plates and the next day we infect them with viruses and we let them attach to the cells but we don't let the virus enter the cell. That can be accomplished by incubating the plate in 4 degrees C that does not allow uh, the virus to come in inside the cell but just allows to attach. And then we wash away all the non-attached viruses and we estimate the viral copy number by a technique called qPCR. So when we performed this experiment we found that these viruses preferentially bind to MPNST cell lines compared to immortalized human Schwann cells or HSC1 lambdas, especially viruses with modified fiber knob domains. So here you can see an unmodified fiber knob domain. It's just a wild type fiber. It's known as AD5. And you can see in green uh, HSC1 lambda, it doesn't really bind it very well. However, other cell lines also don't bind it very well. Those are cancer cells. And here you can see RGD uh, modified fiber. So this, uh, in this fiber, a small peptide has been inserted into the fiber knob of the virus and it makes it much more stickier towards the cancer cell. You can see how much more robustly it binds. And here is another uh, type of modified fiber. It's a chimeric fiber of two different serotypes of adenovirus. Also, it preferentially binds to cancer cells compared to HSC1 lambdas. So next we wanted to know whether or not MPNST cell lines are more susceptible to the killing by this virus compared to non-cancer cell controls. And to answer this question we have seeded the cells again into these multi-well plates and then we infected them with the viruses. This time we only infected them at very, very low doses, so only a few cells per well were initially infected. And then we relied on these initially infected cells to replicate the virus, produce the virus progeny, and then infect the rest of the well, clearing it. So when we stain it with crystal violet on the very last day, the dead cells do not stain with this dye because they're dead and they, they're no longer there. So here you can see we have assessed three different cell lines. HSC1 lambda, which is our non-cancer control. You can see all of them are alive because all are blue, all wells are blue, and quantified here on the bottom at all doses, the cells are all completely viable. And as well as positive control here by day six, they're not yet affected at all, even though they are susceptible to this virus, and we know that. In the middle is the MPNST cell line that uh, you can see purple line on the graph and it beginning to show some cell death at the higher dose by day 6. So by day 12 you can see HSC1 lambda are still unaffected, completely alive and positive control cell line is completely dead so except for those wells that had no virus, so zero virus control and the rest are all dead. And then MPNST cell line in the middle here, 
you can see it's significantly cleared, but not yet completely cleared. At higher doses of the virus, it is almost entirely cleared. And at day 16, you can see that HSC1 lambda compared to MPNST are completely alive. All 100% of them are viable. And MPNST cell lines are basically all dead in all doses except for the no virus control on the very top. So you can see uh, that quantified with the purple line where uh, the cell viability is very, very low, which is uh, encouraging because it suggests there is a therapeutic window. So next question we wanted to answer is whether or not this virus can reduce the tumor growth rate in the mouse in vivo. So here we implant S462TY, which is an MPNST cell line, into the mouse flank. These are immunodeficient mice, otherwise they won't take the human tumor. The tumor is allowed to take and then we are injecting the virus into the tumor and measuring the tumor growth rate. So you can see it here on the graph, each line represents a mouse and each mouse received either PBS or the virus. PBS is a control liquid that we usually suspend virus in. And you can see when injected with PBS, the black lines, the tumor volume goes up quickly and the mice reach this endpoint volume within about 15 to 18 days. However, when injected with the virus, the tumor volume remains stable. So it's not really growing for quite some time, 30 to 40 days and then it begins to grow. So virus is able to control the tumor growth for a while before the tumor breaks out and grows. And we think that the tumor eventually grows out because these mice don't actually have the immune system because they are immunodeficient mice. So in a human, this might be different because human immune system can take over at that point and produce more complete anti-tumor response. We see similar results when we try another type of virus, very similar virus, just different type of fiber. Again, the tumor is well controlled for some time and then it regrows eventually. In conclusion, we found that oncolytic adenovirus preferentially bind to MPNST cells compared to non-cancer cell controls. They also preferentially replicate in the MPNST cell lines compared to non-cancer cell controls and they reduce tumor growth rate in immunodeficient mice bearing MPNST xenografts. Our future directions include investigating the role of the immune system in an anti-tumor response, testing our oncolytic adenoviruses against the patient-derived xenografts, and testing oncolytic adenoviruses with different fiber knobs, and finally constructing potentially better, more specific for MPNST virus that we think may work even better than this one. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation, and um, I think we have time for one or two questions. One interesting question that was posted by a patient was, or, or by uh, somebody from the NF community was, how are the adenoviruses specialized to bind to MPNS T cells, and how specific is that effect compared to other tissues in the body? It's a good, it's a very good question. Um, they are basically, they have been engineered to bind to these molecules called integrins that are found on many uh, cells, but they are particularly abundant on many cancer cells, including MPNST. So it binds to those and that way it can enter better to those uh, cells that have these molecules are in, in big abundance. Okay, okay, great. And then um, one other um, interest would be, you mentioned that the immune system would be perhaps important for the anti-tumor response, which is true, but the immune system might also be um, important for potential side effects patients could experience as they have been with other viruses or even with the same virus used before. And um, have you thought about um, ways how to minimize those risks or what route of injection would you see for patients? Would this be something that you inject in a patient? Would this be directly connected to the tumor? Um, yeah. 
Yes. Um, so we have thought about that, and um, it's a very important question, and that's why we are planning to to our next experiments are planning to investigate the role of the immune system. Um, but we think that it would be quite beneficial for the immune system to get activated against the tumor, which is what these viruses often seem to do. It's mm -hmm. a sort of uh, immune, immunotherapy. So when the tumor begins to lice, and um, then the, the immune cells can get kind of aware that the, there's tumor and the tumor lysis and in, infiltrate into the area. That will be certainly a very informative and very good studies. Very good. And I think we are um, out of time. So thank you so much for this, um, for this great talk. And I will be handing over to uh, Dr. Yohei. Thanks so much. That was a, a outstanding uh, uh, session. And I really appreciate it both to you and Bruce for, for moderating and also for our audience for um, asking such great questions. Um, I do think, you know, we've run over a little bit, but I, I do want to just ask a couple of uh, quick questions of, of both you and Bruce. Um, and first, you know, a couple of the questions that have come up tonight are about, you know, why we have focused so much on MEK inhibitors and MEK inhibition as a strategy for treating uh, NF1 and NF1-related symptoms. Um, and so I'm going to pose the question to both of you, sort of, why you think that is and, and where you think we are, are going uh, in terms of other uh, strategies that we might uh, use in the future. Um, and, um, and finally, I want, for Rena, I was hoping uh, someone had asked you about your work with a particular drug called mavendazole uh, in an animal model of the uh, NF. And I was hoping that you could uh, talk about that a little bit more specifically as well. Um, so, Vrina, do you want to start with that, or? Uh... Happy to start quickly with um, with mebendazole. And um, for those who are not familiar with this, um, mebendazole is a medication that um, is used orally to treat worm infections. And we have been treating worm infections for a very, very long time with this medication in a very safe way. And um, I became interested in that medication um, because we saw, found by accident in the lab an anti-tumor effect of it. So when we implanted tumors into animals, these tumors would suddenly not grow any longer. And we started to investigate potential mechanisms on why that is. And there are actually many different mechanisms um, uh, how mebendazole is working against tumors and inhibits its growth. But one particular mechanism that um, pointed our interest was that it is also, um, it also suppresses RAS activity in um, MPNST cells. And, um, you know, my lab has a large focus on MPNSTs, and um, we thought how we could make the best use of this medication. And based on the fact that this medication had been used for more than 40 years safely, we actually explored this medication as what we call a chemo preventative, which is using a medication to prevent or delay the growth of tumors um, and thereby prevent the use of chemotherapy and other aggressive therapies. And um, we tested this medication in mice, which are similar to our patient, have the natural predisposition to develop um, malignancies, and particularly in this mouse, MPNSTs. So about 60 days after those mice were born, they were started on daily feeds with mebendazole. And we found that indeed mebendazole is able to substantially delay the development 
of these malignancies and increase um, the lifespan of those mice with very little or no side effects. And so we are very encouraged by those findings, but we did not see that it will like 100% prevent like a tumor formation. So these data are certainly like, you know, obtained in the lab and, um, but it is an effect that is very encouraging because at the moment there are no preventative treatments available that are safe in all, uh, safe enough to um, uh, yeah to reduce the risk for those tumor formation, and I think the patient the patients we are. Um, you know, that would benefit, for example, from such a treatment would be patients that have a higher chance for developing those type of cancers, which some of which we can determine by genetic testing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, Bruce, do you wanna comment on different strategies that you think might be uh, uh, worth uh, exploring in the future? Sure, so, um, you know, I think one of the, the um, questions that you asked and have been asked by others is, you know, why MEK inhibitors and, and not something else? And, you know, when you see the, um, the pathway from the cell surface to RAS, ultimately down to the cell nucleus, we're very used to drawing it as a kind of a linear pathway, um, you know, almost a domino effect. One thing leads to the next and to the next and so on. And if, if you take that Literally, you might figure, well, you could block it anywhere in that pathway and the outcome should be the same. That is, alas, a, a pretty oversimplified view of what really is going on in the cell. It is true, but it's not the whole truth. There's, there's lots of side pathways. Um, you can inhibit one thing and something else goes up that it feeds into. So probably not every single domino in that pathway is going to be equally amenable to inhibition or lead to the kind of outcome of reducing the overall activity of the RAS pathway as every other. I don't think we know exactly why MEK inhibitors have turned out to be particularly effective and not some other inhibitor. For example, the first I, that I can recall effort to inhibit the pathway was RAS itself, which would seem like a great idea. It's, the, it's where it all starts. And it's what neurofibromin regulates, but it turns out RAS is not just one protein. There's a family of RAS proteins. They're probably not all working in exactly the same way. And the inhibitor that was used probably didn't equally inhibit all of them. At the end of the day, though, to get to your question about you know, the future, um, you know, the one thing to keep in mind is however wonderful it is that um, selumetinib has made such a big difference. You know, if a tumor shrinks by 20% or even maybe as much as 50%, that doesn't mean it's totally gone away. And um, not everybody responds to MEK inhibitors. So there's plenty of room for additional methods of, of treatment. I think one of the areas that um, you might imagine will come along in these next, I think, maybe a few years, maybe less, are combination therapies, trying more than one kind of inhibitor, either at different points in that pathway or at um, different kind of um, physiological mechanisms that lead to tumor growth. For example, we know tumor cells talk to each other and to the surrounding cells. And if we can block that crosstalk, maybe together with MEK inhibitors will achieve an even better effect. So I think those are a couple of things that um, are likely to come up in these next few years. Um, downstream, you know, there's lots of interest, as you've heard, in, um, in using um, viral vectors um, as treatments and in the long run, you know, ways of, of trying to restore function to the gene even could be imagined. Um, so, you know, there's a long road ahead of us, um, fantastic progress that has been made and a lot of work yet to be done. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's uh, an exciting time um, in the field and one of the things that I feel like I, I learn every time I um, listen to scientific presentations is how far we've come and, and also how far we have to go. Um, there's still so much to know and to learn about uh, NF and, and to, to hone our ability to, to treat the symptoms of NF. Um, so I'm excited for uh, the future. Um, 
Well, I want to thank you, Adrina, again for uh, hosting. Um, and thank you to all the speakers uh, for presenting your data tonight. Um, we really appreciate you making the effort to, to share your work with the community. Um, and I also want to, sh to thank again uh, everyone that participated tonight. Uh, the questions were great. And um, I, I really think it's terrific that um, we have been able to um, really sort of address some really uh, interesting questions and, and connect the scientific community with the, with the patient community. So um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Kate Kelts, who's going to uh, talk us out. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Yohei. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I just wanted to say that we are really grateful here at CTF for the NF community and for your continued engagement and support of us. Um, you joined us tonight from literally all over the world. We had over 20 different states from the US um, represented tonight. The Cayman Islands, Argentina, Canada, and the UK, and probably some places that I missed. So that was very exciting. Also, thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, our moderators, to NYU Langone Health for helping us um, with planning and preparing and all the hard work that their team has put into this event. And thank you to AstraZeneca for their ongoing support of this and all future forum events for this year. Um, we hope that you will join us next month, July 16th, for our next NF1 virtual forum event. And again, if you had any questions this evening that were not addressed, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm the patient support coordinator for CTF. I'm a nurse and I'm happy to connect you with any resources that you might need. Um, so please, everyone, have a wonderful evening. We hope we see you all next month for our next event. And good night. <laughs>